Hello, welcome to the Monday, April 27th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storms and Us Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. I've got a quick note from Didier on Friday about where do you find all of those malware samples, like the ones that he is writing about in his diaries. Now, VirusTotal, of course, is probably sort of the ultimate repository of malware and real great service in that you can easily, for example, search for malware. But typically to download malware, well, uh, you have to pay with VirusTotal and it's pretty expensive to sort of get uh, their full service. Now, there are other sites that are popping up uh, that are offering malware downloads for free. Malware Bazaar is one that DDA likes and uses you just give it essentially the hash and it will tell you if it has the malware available and allows you to download it malware bazaar is run by abuse.ch an organization that has offered a number of very useful free services so pretty much a trustworthy source of course remember you are downloading fully functional malware here so better be careful what you are doing also, in order to upload malware to Malware Bazaar, well, you can only upload what's actually known malware. With VirusTotal, you sometimes actually run into benign uh, documents that uh, users uploaded for whatever reason, maybe because it was somewhat suspicious, but not everything in VirusTotal is necessarily malware. And the Canadian Internet Registry Authority, Kyra, that's essentially the organization responsible for the .ca top-level domain, is rolling out what they're calling Canadian Shield, which is essentially a DNS over HTTPS service that's sort of targeting, well, the internet users north of the wall. Now, they offer three different levels of their service. One they call private, which means it's just a open recursive DNS server. They have a protected service that does block malware and phishing. And finally, there's a family service that also does block pornographic content. So you kind of can pick what you would like here, what you feel comfortable with. So that's similar to what we have seen from other DNS over HTTPS services. Now, a lot of the announcement language is sort of around how this is going to protect uh, Canadian uh, internet users. I don't really see anything here why a non-Canadian couldn't use this service. But uh, then again, all of the infrastructure is lo located in Canada. So probably best suited for users that are located in Canada as well. And if you've listened to any other podcast or news uh, show, you probably have heard about the effort currently underway to create some kind of uh, COVID-19 tracing application for smartphones or wearable devices. Now, there are really uh, three different approaches uh, that are currently sort of being considered. Apple and Google uh, came up uh, with their protocol. Then uh, there's another protocol called DP. 3T and one called a PEP PT. Now, the later two standards uh, were created by two different groups of academics. It's a real interesting problem, of course, uh, to provide just the information needed for the application to be useful without actually violating anybody's privacy. So in order to build an application like this, you actually don't need geolocation because it doesn't really matter where the user was. What matters is what other users that particular user came in contact with and it doesn't really matter where this happens. So none of these protocols really uses geolocation. Instead, they all just a beacon a random identifier. Now I call it random here, but it's really sort of a hash that's uh, derived cryptographically and it keeps changing. So it's not that if you see the same identifier twice, you would know that's the same person. Actually, you should never see the same identifier twice. How often uh, these identifiers are rotated? Well, uh, that depends a little bit on the details of the protocol. And then the application will record any other identifiers that it observed close enough for the application to matter. And of course, that's where some Bluetooth trick 
trickery happens where they try to estimate the distance to the other device. So all of these received beacons are typically stored on device and only kept for as long as is necessary to detect a COVID-19 infection, which should be about two weeks. Only if uh, the user is detected as COVID-19 positive, then the user has the ability, not the obligation, to upload the data to a central database. Now, how this exactly happens, again, uh, there that varies. Uh, there are different sort of authentication schemes where your healthcare provider will give you a code that you can essentially use to authenticate yourself as being uh, positive and then being allowed to upload the data. Also, not all of these protocols use one central database. One suggests sort of several regional databases or other schemes. Also sort of to spread out the risk a little bit and not have sort of one central data collector. Now, all the uninfected people can periodically pull that database, essentially download the entire database in some of these schemes and uh, then check if they recognize their own uh, token that they have sent within the last four 14 days in the data that was received by positively identified as infected individuals. So a pretty neat sort of scheme. I put links to the three different specifications uh, in the show notes if you want to look at it in more detail. At this point, of course, it looks like the Apple Google uh, collaboration will be the one that will be widely implemented. That's of the other thing in order for this to actually work, there needs to be an sort of an overwhelming uh, participation uh, in uh, this application. So we'll see how this all works out. And Sophos is reporting active attacks against the Sophos XG firewall, exploiting a SQL injection vulnerability. Sophos did release an extensive uh, knowledge base article about uh, this particular vulnerability and how it's being exploited. They also released a hotfix to fix the vulnerability. So if you are using a Sophos XG firewall, please double check and read the knowledge base article from Sophos to see if you're possibly attacked. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.